Welcome to the presentation on Epidiagogy of Practice. My name is Liana Psarologaki. I'm the Head of Architecture at the University of Suffolk at Ipswich and the Chair of Education for the Royal Institute of British Architects in the East Region. Benjamin Powell, lecturer in architecture and director at Studio Manifest, who is lead investigator for this research and I, will be discussing how we can create a pivotal culture for learning architecture in the future. The research we will present is shaped by debates between the two of us as educators and a synthesis of theory and practice. It is made possible in the context of the new School of Architecture we founded two years ago at Suffolk and which uniquely treats architecture as affordance of life. Our pedagogy model is based on principles of education that go back to the root and mutate as new. In our school, we see ourselves as environmental professionals who work with ecologists to teach architecture. We do so by focusing on the learning of disclosive skills and we teach in a resilient and agile way using the studio as a flexible learning platform. Most of us who teach in various roles do not realize or have little time to know about how much the role of the teacher has changed since the first academy was established. The role of the pedagogue started with and stems etymologically and ontologically from the slave who leads the learner to the school, handing them over to the schoolmaster who teaches formation of character and intelligence. Fast forward to modern times, the teacher in higher education has been long a tutor delivering training for performance and achievement in line with industry demands in countries like the UK and where universities are driven by business and government, according to mission statements. This leads us to the maverick model of the utopian educator by Darren Webb. In the current oblique cultural landscape, Webb asks for an education based on longing, hope, liberation, imagination, and the capacity of learners to organize lives in new ways. He speaks of an education of desire, which can lead to better ways of being. Driven by desire, Webb argues, we can develop a pedagogy of kinship, communication, intimacy, curiosity, and uncertainty. One of materiality and presence, actual and virtual. In such a progressive classroom, a studio of desire, there is a culture, a collective we, and the distance between what is lived, the experience, and what is learned, the knowledge, is diminishing. Only then and there, he says, we can use our intellectual and cultural weapons to stretch the existing structure and deal with the teacher's stress. This stress is an inherent illness assigned to our generation of teachers and learners. We are a neurologically and since 2019 also an immunologically suffering age. Since 2009, in his book Capitalist Realism, K-Punk author Mark Fisher has questioned the affective capacity of the contemporary learner, who may be too savvy, but is ahistorical and struggles to approach education as lifelong emotional and intellectual need. Fisher calls this a reflexive impotence, the inability to imagine new ways of being and the tendency to settle for a future that never comes. Talking about students, he says, they know things are bad, but more than that, they know they cannot do anything about it. And there are two dimensions to this will and desire. The will has to be educated itself to endure the strains of civilization, and desire is a primitive form of affective drive for life. When power of desire is negative, will will be weak and education is suppressed. The learner is in a state of abulia. K 
can we use insights on mental fatigue, like these ones by cultural historian Nelson Rabinbach, and factor them in our pedagogy? What is in assertion of desire for us to use and reform in order to reinstate the will to learn? By means of a critical response to these questions, we piloted two new modes of learning for students on the BA Honours Architecture at Suffolk, and which we bring to you to reflect upon. These will serve as the debate platforms for us to question and reshape the role of the utopian educator in the future of virtual studios of desire. The first learning activity entails a live building visit with participants, the learners, taken on virtual tours in the field by a guide, the teacher, using their mobile device to record themselves moving around a physical space. The feed is shared in real time using live tracking technology. Participants follow the guide's location and complement the guide's commentary, referring to online content shared prior to the session. Like in a game, they actively play, directing the guide to specific points of interest they have identified and therefore shaping the learning. The newly developed elephant and castle housing estate was explored as the first test case. As a new and well publicised development, including some controversy around its inception, a significant amount of pre-existing online resources were available both to provide participants with context and to assist in the tour itself. Amongst other things, this included an interactive map of the estate with links that could be clicked on to describe individual buildings around the development. Whilst the field visit provided a tangible physical context through which to understand some of the core topics from the student's module, including planning and detailed design, the event itself was structured as a form of situated learning. To this extent, specific measurable learning activities were omitted in favour of enabling students to follow their own desires and to construct their own appreciation of the situation through being active and engaged within their network of peers. A significant volume of discussion and questions were raised, intimating some level of success as a form of engagement. It has also been noted that since the activity, the specific environment appears to have become a point of reference for many of the students when raising questions about the wider course content. The second case study is a virtual collaborative design workshop titled The Architecture Hackathon, where learners and tutors work together on a concept design for a live project. The physical studio is reformed as an interactive online virtual space with video conferencing and shared folders. The workshop structure presents a series of activities, labs, designed to stimulate the flow of ideas and encourage interaction. In both cases, learning is dynamically participatory and provides a blend of theory and practice and human and non-human assemblages. Happening during the summer, outside of the taught curriculum, students were challenged with developing the concept designs for a smart living research laboratory currently being developed by the University of Suffolk in partnership with BT. The event took place over two sessions with a group of around 12 participants. In the first session, precedents were assembled and sketch designs developed. In the second session, a collaborative BIM environment was utilised through which the sketch designs were developed into 3D proposals. As well as being a great opportunity for architecture students to gain experience working on a live project and to see their designs develop into a built scheme, the incredible energy and enthusiasm from participants have provided the project itself with a unique platform from which to grow. Feedback from the session was positive, with all respondents, 6 out of 12, rating the event either very good or excellent and feeling they had learned a significant amount about sustainable design. These two learning activities demonstrate that we can hope for multiple dimensions and possibilities. This is as in the model of the Utopian Educator by Darren Webb and what we defined as the virtual studio of desire. The gamification of the learning field in the case of the situated and agile interrogation of the elephant and castle site allowed for extended accessibility active participation and mutation of the survey and the field itself. 
The same site will be mapped differently each time the exercise takes place, based on the synchronous feed of empirical data coming from each participant. The learning itself becomes choreography and cartography, an agile activity where the educator facilitates the game, which activates desire and in turn actuates the learning. In the learning activity of the hackathon, desire is emancipated via engagement in education where the learner assumes responsibility of a professional in a wider didactic setting. The opening and demystification of the professional field, the game, creates a culture for the growth of collective will. The learner owns the outcome together with the educator. They are not just consumers of the learning service, but instead develop a sense of belonging and intimacy with both the learning itself and its outcomes. The learning therefore ceases to be a personal commodified good. It becomes a common, an element that carries the moral obligation for the fulfillment of the outcomes and therefore the personal success that comes from achieving it collectively. Humanity measures indeed value by achievement. This is evident in metrics, performance indicators and the expectation that people with higher qualifications will in principle be paid more in their professional standing. This is far from the meritocracy of today. For example, in architecture, the vast majority of qualified graduates come from privileged backgrounds and would have received extensive training in higher education. The salary ranges do not follow the pattern, however, when compared with other fields. In this bizarrely indexed professional field called architecture and its education that tends to be rightly eclectic, it is very difficult to perform an anthropological mapping. Who are these people who sign up by thousands every year to train vocationally and academically? What is the profile of the architecture learner? The answer is idiosyncratic and we will only attempt to identify the protagonists that shape the game and allow for mutations of the map. To start with, we must address learners as nomads and the classroom, the roster of the game, as a people and not a society. We borrow these terms from philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who identifies the nomad as a situated, non-territorialized entity and not somebody who travels all the time per se. The nomads, our people, do not form social constructs in the learning game. They form networks on the map that they themselves inscribe in situ based on desire. They see the field as an endless flux of possibilities. They are hefted and they know their way around by culture of the game itself, what we call studio culture, and of course the robust legacies of architectural education. Finishing up and instead of a conclusive statement, it would be more useful now to perform some contemplation and a reflective exercise on the question of using pedagogy or the teaching of the learning game itself towards establishing a sense of citizenship. This involves understanding the learning field as a map and network and developing the collective sense of the learner's ownership in the outcomes beyond achievement towards an ethics. We must remember that no conventional territorial relationships apply here. The learning game is situated, shaped by nomads, owned by a people. This offers to the learners the freedom to perform networks of desire when the game is formed, which means that the studio culture is not any more vertical, it is agile and virtual, with endless possibilities of mutation. Such a condition of learning we must accept is not necessarily stable, but this means that it is not by default stagnated either. On the contrary, such learning model is an assemblage of idiosyncratic worlds. It is a cosmos of education. It can be translated into playful exercises using artificial intelligence or machine learning endless attempts to perform tectonic experiments with dried pasta, a role-playing script for resolving a legal dispute, or a live feed 
into a site being built at the same time as being designed remotely. And this is because the learning must remain intimate, open-ended, impulsive and liberating, and must lead to imagining, creating, and at the same time inhabiting new worlds. So let the next step towards the future of education be a non-administrative one, but instead, a much-needed shift towards the beauties of possibility.